Welcome to Zen and the Art of Real Estate Investing. What if you could learn from experienced real estate investors, find out what got them to where they are now, get insight into their daily habits, and take these insights to inspire your own growth? Each week, Jonathan Green shares an in-depth look at the mindful approach to real estate investing. Jonathan is a real estate investor, advisor, and coach, as well as the founder of Streamlined Properties and the team leader of Streamlined Properties on Market, brokered by eXp Realty. Whether you are looking to start from scratch, get to the next level, or just a straightforward and honest approach to real estate investing, Jonathan seeks to provide a free mentorship program you can take with you anywhere. Now, here's Jonathan. This is episode 16 of Zen and the Art of Real Estate Investing. My guest today is my friend, Scott Friedman. Scott, welcome to the show. I want to get the hello in and then I'm going to read your bio in. How are you? Good, Jonathan. Thank you for having me. Really yeah, appreciate man. it. Excited to be here. Yeah, me too. Pleasure to have you on. Here's a quick bio on Scott. So Scott and his wife, Marissa, are home transformation specialists. And I know this from watching them on Instagram. Their company is The Home Revivalist, which I love the name, by the way. And both Scott and Marissa had 10 plus years in their respective businesses. Scott in real estate investments and the property revival space, Marissa in fashion, before they combine forces to make this home revivalist thing go. It's been a nice ride for you. What was your experience in real estate before you guys started to team up on this project? Yeah, good question. So I, out of college, I got into sort of finance, went the route of a lot of my friends working in the city. But luckily, I had one very good friend that I grew up with who went right into real estate. He moved down to Charleston, South Carolina, I helped him move down there, spent a summer with him, and he got his commercial license and got into commercial real estate, and he needed money. And luckily, I had some money working in finance in New York City. So while I was working in finance for 10 years in my 20s and early 30s, I was the investor, the financial investor for him down in Charleston. So he would do all the work, flip a home, I would send the money to him, and we would split the proceeds. And this was pre-kids and pre-marriage. So I would go fly down every three months and be like, oh, this is amazing. Great job. And it was the easiest money I ever made. And I just started to fall in love with the process and real estate that way. That's awesome. Partnerships can go awry so much. What was it that you knew that you and this initial partner would be okay doing it? I'm incredibly hesitant with any type of partnerships. I rarely do it. Yeah, I stay away. I've seen so many horror stories, but he's literally probably my best friend growing up and just one of those guys that's a straight shooter. His dad's a straight shooter. He's from the country. Like you just, I've never heard a lie from him in my life. I, he's one of maybe five people I know that I could give a million bucks to and I not even think twice. So that was the primary reason. I also, he was an incredibly hard worker and I just knew he was going to do well, whatever he did too. So a lot of trust in him. Yeah, um, that's awesome. That. And I think a lot of people that we've talked to use existing relationships to bridge those first ones, but you really have to be invested together in the vision. You were interested in real estate before, but were, did this obviously got you excited about then doing it on your own? How many projects did you guys do before you started to go in on your own? Yeah, we. I didn't go in on my own until I left my actually towards the end of my full-time job, I started doing projects on my own. So I'd say I started investing him maybe when I was 24, 25, a good 10 years probably of doing one or two flips a year with him, just being the investor. So we did at least 15 together. And then- Were were they all in Charleston or the area? All in Charleston. Oh, Oh, awesome. All in Charleston. We started out, I think the first home we bought was like $16,000 and we split like 8,000 and it was like, I got a check for 4,000. I was like, oh my God. But it was like free money for me because I didn't have, I didn't do any work really. And it was great. And then I think people forget that sometimes not losing is a big win or just making a little like to not want to break the bank and win every transaction is really important when you're new, especially for you, who at the time was more of a passive side and the money end, but also like interested in the project. But to know, like when you get four grand and you're like, this is successful, you're setting up something good instead of being like, oh, I should have made a hundred. 
how did you guys know that it was okay to just make a little bit on the first one and not want the boatload of money? We were both green. Like he was green and I was green and we wanted something not too risky. We bought the cheapest house we could find yeah. that we could fix up. So our risk was limited. And if worst case scenario, up until recently, always had a backup with a flip, which was a rental. So that was always our fallback. If we can't sell it as a flip, make sure it works as a rental. And we'll have some rentals. Um, that's kind of that's yeah, that, it, that, advanced, though. You were only 24 when you started. How did you know to have kind of dual exit strategies? Is it from your background or from finance? Because obviously, we coach everyone. Like, you need dual exit strategies now. It's just a smart move. But how did you know that so young and so green to think smartly like that? Okay, hey, look, if we flip it and we're, the market doesn't look good for a sale, we'll just rent it. Yeah. I think I, I took a, I got my MBA in finance and, and I was obsessed in, in my twenties watching those real estate shows. Yeah. I think they were better back then, yeah. back in the day, the flipping shows. And it's actually funny because the one, the first biggest flipping show that I remember watching was based in Charleston. I don't know if you remember, it was called like trademark properties or something. Probably. Yeah. I'm sure I watched and, it. <laughs> yeah. And it was a guy in Charleston flipping. And so you do, you can learn a little bit from those. And then I would, I devoured flipping books at that time, whatever I could, new one I could get my hands on. So I went to buy those books a lot in the shows and just gut instinct. And we luckily, he was a great partner to have. We would just bounce things back and forth. I and mean, he was very cautious and risk averse too. Um, but it, it was such a great learning experience. And that 16, I, the next house was probably like we bought for 35 and we each made eight grand. And then we just quarter kept reinvesting and the next house was 70 and then 150. And then by the time we were at year eight, nine and 10, we were buying million dollar homes and making a hundred. All from the like original snowball, really. You just Correct. kept rolling the snowball to like get bigger. That's what's so interesting about it. I think it's a patience thing. If you're working together with a partner, you're working on something that's interesting, but you have to have the patience or one party is always pushing to get more just in terms of the partnership. Cause I know everybody asks, it's always a thing I've done them as well. So were you the money side and he was the work side and then you just split the profit 50, 50 generally. That's exactly yeah. how it was. So yeah. he did all the work. He found the property. He was the contractor on the property. He was in the beginning, the agent on the property. Yeah. And I had nothing to do with the renovation. He would send me his budget so I could get to know the process and walk me through things. But he did all the work. I was all the money, the, the purchase and the rehab money. Yeah. And then we would split it 50, 50, which to this day, I still think is a pretty fair way to do it. You can do I it agree. other ways. But... Yeah. To me, if I want a partnership, I just want it to be even on all ends. So if I were financial partners, I just Jenny and I are doing now, we're just putting in the exact same amounts. But yeah, mm -hmm. if I'm the money of the transaction, somebody else is the work, I just want the split to be 50 50. So we know so there may be some days where you feel like you're like really overworking, but mm -hmm. we couldn't even do this. And I'm paying for the, it depends on materials. Like it's just a lot. So I think that may firming up those agreements, it definitely helped that you had a trust factor going in. Cause I feel like the reason why we both say nah, partnerships are pretty much a no for me, just because I don't have the trust factor. I can do it with my best friend now. Cause I, like you said, I don't have to worry about where the money's going. It's all accounted for. And also I don't care. Like I have no worries that I'm going to lose money in a transaction with my best friend. So yeah. when you guys finished, what was the impetus that finally led to you really doing it full time and leaving finance? Yeah. So I fell in love with it over those 10 years. And I realized that I have a passion in real estate and I didn't really growing up or in high school or college, I didn't even think about real estate much. It was just through investing with my best friend and making money and seeing how lucrative it could be. And I thought I could be good at it. So I fell in love with it and then thought I want to do this on my own. Like I can do this I've seen the process now 15 times yeah. and felt confident. And I finally, I was working my butt off in finance. So I finally had a nice nest egg to invest with. So I had the money, I had the experience and I was in a market in New Jersey that I thought had potential that I really was getting to know too. So I feel like those are three of the most important things. Where were you in Maplewood already then? Or yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I had just moved. I was in Hoboken for a while and then I had moved to Maplewood and actually another trigger, these funny things kept happening. So I moved to a rental in Maplewood that I found on Craigslist. Mm -hmm. 
I don't know what this was now, 15 years ago. And it was 2,500 a month for this ha- really nice, like 2,500 square foot, four bedroom house, two blocks from the train station. Nice. Yeah, we, it was a great way to figure out if we liked the town. We yeah. loved the town. But about six months in, my wife calls me from work crying, and we got a, a sheriff letter to the door saying you're being evicted. You oh have 30 God. days to move out. So my wife's bawling, and I'm super excited. As yeah. soon as I got the call, yeah. I'm like, this is a great opportunity. And it wasn't easy, but I eventually tracked down the note holder at the bank who was in charge of it. I convinced him by showing him every house for sale behind us on the Irvington side yeah. and got him to give me a great deal. I bought it for 500 grand and a week later I put it on the market for 650 and sold it in three days. Oh, that's awesome. And uh, that was my first taste of it. And as soon as I did that, I was like, oh, this is it. Yeah. I'm in. Yeah. And that's a very, yeah, I don't want any listeners to get their hopes up that they can get direct contact with the bank and work it out because it's, you just have to be in the right spot at the right time to make that happen. And when you're the tenant, you have leverage because you're already there and you had leverage because you had assets, which is an important thing I wanted to drop back on, which I think we've touched on two episodes ago when this one comes out with John Erico is that a lot of us were working regular jobs to support our real estate investing until the time that we felt like, okay, now we can do it. And that's another thing that you said is, no, I was working my butt off because you're making the nest egg so that when you do it, it's okay. I worry for the investors who think they're gonna create a nest egg from zero because it doesn't work like that. You need capital to invest or a special set of skills where you can be the other side that will make profits. Is that something that you've seen now after all these years where maybe newer investors or even experienced investors are making a mistake thinking that all of their income is going to come early from real estate investing? It's just not that easy. Yeah, it's not. It, it's easy once you have the capital and the expertise Like any other field, it becomes easy after 10, 15 years of experience. But even today, like I struggle to find deals. I I flip so many homes and I still, every flip gives me headaches and issues and surprises. (laughs) It's bar none. No matter how easy or clear you think a flip is good, it always goes sideways. It just boggles my mind if anybody thinks having a flipping business is some type of passive income. It's literally like flipping is the least passive thing ever. Mm -hmm. It's like saying hit on the bike, H-I-I-T is not exercise. It's like the hardest. Mm -hmm. There's just nothing else to it. So when did your wife get involved? I'm sure you were always looking at things together and working together. But when did you guys decide to partner up and really go in and do this home revivalist business? Yeah, good question. So she was in fashion, doing really well as an executive in the fashion industry. She worked for Armani and some other companies, Betsy Johnson for a while. And then she left when we had our second kid to stay at home and started getting into designing our home. And then she started doing family members' homes, doing the interior decorating. And it was an easy transition for her. She has an incredible eye, whether it's fashion or home design or art. So very quick, was good at it. And then she had some friends asking her to do their interior design. So she sort of actually started her interior design business While I was still working in the city and flipping in Charleston, she had her business was called Wallflower and she was like a local interior designer doing quite well on her own. And then it wasn't until I left my financial job at Ernst & Young five years ago, it was actually five years ago this fall, I left to do real estate full time. Then I had the time to devote to it. So more time to do a little more than just flip. So we teamed up created the Home Revivalists, which is like the husband and wife teams on like Chip and Joanne, yeah. similar. So she does all the design. I'm the contractor. We design and build. And that was started. I left five years ago. So maybe four years ago is when we teamed up together. She still has her own, some clients. I still have my own stuff, but we do a lot of, we do our flips together and we do some client business together as well. Yeah. So on the contract, again, you're doing your own jobs with your own crew. Correct. Yeah. Do you have more than one crew now, or is it just one crew, one at a time, depending on where you're going? I have one crew, six guys that I keep busy full time, two carpenters, two painters, and like a handyman. Yeah. So I've had them for a couple of years now, and I'm busy enough to take them from project to project. 
And then I will sub out the roof and the masonry and exterior painting and yeah. chimney work. For, but you, you have, have your team to do the stuff that they're comfortable with. It's interesting, though, for people who want to get their own crew, you have to always have another property in the pipeline because they're on salary. So you can't like, you know, if you have nothing to do one day, sometimes it helps. A lot of people will get multiple jobs, but I think that can be dicey as well. I like to go from one to the next, but if, has that ever come up for you where you're like, Ooh, we need another property in the pipeline. we got to keep these guys going. You know, what's funny for it hasn't until this fall. So for three, four straight years, yeah. I've been back to back and I close on a property and I buy them the next day. And we, my wife and I said, we were going to take the summer off. So we tried to slow things down so we could take this summer, the and it ended up the project going over. So we really only have a couple of weeks in August off, but I didn't have another thing lined up right away. So the guys have actually been in my house for the last month working for, for the first get time. Get a new in a kitchen while. going or something. So you do you, a lot of the renovations. I know you've done some in New Jersey, but I think you've done some out in the Hamptons as well. Or, or those are all sorts of jobs. Where have you guys done renovations, and what's like the preferred scale for you? Do you want to do something bigger, or are you also doing smaller jobs that are Full on consulting for someone who maybe needs, we want to completely redo a kitchen, something like that. Yeah. So if it's client work, it's mainly, I'd say we specialize in kitchens, higher end kitchens. We feel like that's our biggest impact, bringing a designer in and really making it a wow kitchen. But we'll do full home renovations too. I've done a couple jobs for clients where I didn't buy the house, but my realtor sold it to someone else. And before they move in, he'd be like, hire Scott and Marissa. They'll yeah. do a full transformation for you. I'd say we do one of them a year and then maybe one or two kitchens and bathrooms a year. I won't just do a bathroom or a interior paint. That's not really worth it. It's usually yeah. at least a kitchen for a client project. And then when I do my flips, it's we really do everything. I'll rip apart the inside and because the homes I buy are usually in pretty bad shape. So we'll do the full interior exterior and redo it. Yeah. I mean, I, I've been watching along. You're doing some extremely high-end renovations. Do you feel, I mean, I felt like this. I feel like as you grow as a real estate investor, the more you buy in at, even if it's a junkie property, you just have more scale for profit. So is there a little bit more risk? I actually don't think so, but it's just, it's like a little heavier on you because, you know, if yeah. you're buying in at five, six, seven hundred and you're hoping to get out at 1.5, your renovations are going to be a couple hundred too. So you have a lot weighing on it. When the markets shift, does that ever make you nervous if you're a mid-renovation? I'm sure it's happened over the last several years. We're like, I'm not sure if the market's going to comply with what we want. Because Jenny and I are in the middle of a flip now, and we're just watching the market. And we know we're doing something unique, but you still wonder what's going to happen. Has that happened for you guys, where you're doing like one that you love, but the market doesn't look as accepting? I That's those are really good points and questions. I don't... I pay attention to the market, but I never... That's never my baseline. I never count on appreciation. I never assume the market's going to go up. I always, I do assume it's going to go flat at mm, least. I don't yeah. ever really take into account that it's going to go down. <laughs> Luckily, we've had a good 10, 12 year run. I think where we live, it's going to have effects everywhere else before we hit here. Cause even this fall, like I thought there was going to be a dip in the summer was slow, but now yet again, this fall, I'm seeing multiple bids all over and I agree. Wood. I'm not buying any of it, at least not where we are. Are there less bids now? Sure. Our house is maybe selling a little bit less near us. Honestly, where you are in Maplewood, not really. They're still selling at the highest values because the desire to live there is still there. It's yeah. We live in markets in here that we talked about, obviously, way back when we met on the meetups. It's just we live in a great area. So it, I guess I would say it's harder to miss in terms of your asset, but like, the properties we were saying in the last two years were harder to buy because the deals even off market were terrible <laughs> for people yeah. like us who know what we have to put in. It's like we can really come through the data and say, that's not even close. I can't make enough money to make it worth it for me. It's been hard the last couple of years to find deals. When I started buying homes in Maplewood eight years ago, I was buying them for, I think my first one was like 300 and then I bought one for 375 yeah. and then I was buying them in the fours. And then it was the fives and yeah. now I'm buying homes in Maplewood. My last one I bought that I'm selling in a couple of weeks, I had, I spent like 875 on it. And how you know, much a reno do you have to do to that 875? Two, two and a quarter. Yeah. My, my, my rehabs are usually between 150 and 225, usually right around 175, 200. I yeah. Spend. 
Yeah. And then uh, what, what's a general out price on those? Like one, two or one, four? I was hoping to get one, four, yeah. but this one's on Wyoming, which is a little bit busier of a road. I actually, I'm going to get one, three for it. So not quite what I was hoping for, yeah. but. Good and good yeah. in this market though, and I think being smart as an investor on the sales side, where I've definitely hurt myself in the past as being too fired up about my own project. <laughs> That's such a good lesson on this property. This is such a good lesson, and I still find out this lesson the hard way at least once a year. Yeah, I had two people begging me for this property when I was working on it in the spring. Two offers, really good offers. Yeah. One for one, two, five before I really even got going. And at that time in the spring, homes were going for one, five, one, six with 20 offers. Yeah. Yeah. I'm thinking, no, I'm going to, I'm not going to give this person. I would have walked away with like, <laughs> sounds like me. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, we're all inherently greedy. Right. So it's so hard, but I've learned the one main lesson I would say is you take the offer. If you have an offer, the first offer, or whatever it is, it's usually the best offer. Never turn down money. They're usually the most motivated when they're coming in. I worry a little on pre-construction offers. I think it's good for you guys because you have a portfolio of completed properties for the home revivalist. So people can bid on your stuff and be like, oh, it's going to be as nice as this last one that sold for 1.3. So they're not worried. I worry about pre-construction buys with people with no track record because I feel like they're going to say, oh, if you want the nice granite, now that's extra 7,500 and it never ends. So I think it's good to have that portfolio. You guys, Instagram is good. Social is good. So people can follow along. Is that where those those pre-construction or mid-construction buyers came from? Clients that already knew who you guys were or they were just coming around? No, we've had that happen once or twice where we'll get like DMs and show people and I made one deal that way. But normally we just put it on the MLS. Oh, like, early, you know, early. Yeah, yeah. We, I put it lately. I've been like, I bought it for 850 or what, 875. I put it on the MLS for 999 and I got an offer and then, but we had already started. So yeah. it was like two weeks too late. So then we put it on the MLS for one, two, and we got the offer for one, two, five. And again, I was another like two weeks further and I just was looking at these comps in the area. And then um, another big thing you need to do in our area is get the houses done by Memorial Day, because I don't know if you see that as much in Montclair and West Orange, but people really don't look as much in the summer. People, Our buyers are mostly from New York City and Hoboken and Brooklyn and Jersey City. And they have their kids at home. They're going to the beach. They're going to the Jersey Shore, the Hamptons. So it really slows down in the summer. So anytime, the two times I've had to take a property off and relist it is because one, I missed the summer yeah. cut off. I listed in June and the other one was just a busy road. Those yeah. are some yeah. mistakes I've made. Yeah. I think sometimes you get the best deals with some type of anomaly, like a busy road. It's interesting though, in New Jersey, because busy roads in a lot of towns are like the hottest roads, which to me is like a little bit crazy. But it's yeah, really then it's more about the setback, like how far back are you from the road and does it matter? Do you have a one car with driveway or two? Can you turn around? Because like backing out onto a busy road is the worst. So uh-huh. these are things that I think maybe people don't think about, but I think they're big deals and an overall value because you can have someone who no problem plunking down 1.4 million, but they look at, I don't want to back into traffic every day. <laughs> So it's like, there's always something that you have to look out for. But I think where we started this just small part of the conversation is knowing when it's a good idea to take the offer. And we've all fallen into that trap and we've all regretted it (laughs) for years later when we watched the profit slip through our hands that we should have taken. What's the back and forth like between you and your wife when it comes to the sales side? Is she done? She's already done all the work to make it look perfect, which I've seen. And I'm like, these just look like show houses. And then does she just leave that part to you? Or are you guys really crunching the numbers on terms of like, what do we need to get for this? What do we want to get for this? What's going to be the next project? Because I think in any partnership, whether it's a marriage or business partnership, partners play each role, but there's always projects where you like really both want the same amount of input in terms of what the end result is. Yeah, she has an incredible eye and she's not, she doesn't get involved with the numbers at all. So I make the call and do everything that has to do with the purchase. And then she really needs to stop by not even once a week anymore. We've got such a process down. She used to stop by once a week, but now it's like we have a nice office 
here in Maplewood and we'll pick out tile and pick out the flooring and pick out the lights. And I've even, I went from having no design eye to being around her enough that I have similar taste to her now. So I'll even get some lights ready for her to quickly approve or pick out the tile for her to approve. So honestly, I probably need her for sometimes only 10 hours for a project, you know, just an hour. That's good though, because you learn from her which things are working. And then I'm sure she has input on like, I actually, that's that's old now. That was good last year. It's not good anymore, Scott. You need to take that down. They don't want (laughs) that type. The biggest, the only time we argue, and it's over the same thing, every project we will have a successful house and we'll do great on it. And the next house to me, I want to do the same thing. Like the white stone was perfect. Yeah, yeah. Like the, the cabinets were perfect. Everyone loved them. Can we, why wouldn't we just do the same thing? And every time she needs to stretch it again and do yeah. something totally different yeah. and do three different colors in the kitchen that sounds like me i'm more like her in that aspect okay. don't want to replicate the formula i like the yeah. money formula to be the same but i yeah. just get bored i want them all to look different but houses inherently have so much character that you're just able to work around it and create a different pro- different product each time so yeah. where do you where are you spending most of your time doing jobs is it still around this area in essex county or are you doing more in new york also yeah, I just finished that Maple one, Maplewood one a couple of weeks ago. Most of my projects are in Maplewood, South Orange. We have a few things in Madison and Chatham that are client related. We're doing a cool little bookstore in Melbourne. Oh, awesome. Uh, just That's really cool. It. Yeah. I have two buildings in Maplewood that I sort of property manage and that, that involves some upkeep on the commercial side. Have the guys in here a little bit helping me with that. But primarily it's been the Hamptons and usually it's one project, one thing going on with the guys in the Hamptons and then the, in Maplewood lately over the last year. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Let's get into some of the questions that I ask all of our guests. And I'm always going to remind you because sometimes you, you filled out this form a while ago. Greatest influence in real estate and why? You said your close friend, Dave Denunzio. How come and where did that come from? Where did that partnership or friendship start? Is that the first person that you talked about? Correct. Yeah, so awesome. we, yeah, yeah. We met in fifth grade and yeah, he's, he became a real estate guy. We flipped houses as a team throughout our twenties and he's what got me passionate and got in, got me into it. Yeah. It's awesome. I really feel like what you said at the beginning resonates with me now flipping with my best friend. You just don't have to worry about the things that you do with, I appreciate why new investors want to find money partners and build partnerships, but like, it's really tough to agree on everything. And to be okay on spending more money on a project when you need to. And I think when you're working with your friend, you just have it like, oh, do you think it's the best thing? Yeah, that's your expertise. Okay, great. Just do it. Is that the kind of relationship that you guys had that made it easier? That's a really good point because it's so important. Not only should that person either, in my mind, either be bringing all the money or bringing the expertise or you're both bringing money and expertise. But it's our the one negative about flipping is it's a lot of times it's just me thinking in my head and I have no one to bounce yeah. my thoughts off of or when I'm 50-50 about something or should I do this bathroom too. It's so nice to have an experienced partner too to constantly be bouncing ideas off of and you're going to have a better product if you're brainstorming on those things. So that's a partner should bring that to the table too. Yeah. And you brought up a great point, just being able to bounce things off each other. It's actually how we met. We met via, did we meet via my meetups, the originals and in the art of real estate? Yeah. I think that's the first time I met you. That was like beginning pandemic two and a half years ago. But we found through those that just knowing other investors and understanding what they do helps give you so much more confidence as a newer investor and even experienced investor. Cause like we can talk about projects we've done and then you're like, Oh wow. Okay. Now, like I already feel like I know more of what's going on currently in Maplewood with the flip game, which helps me. And that helps me help Mm -hmm. clients, helps me help investors. So I I can't stress enough. Have you found that you, your investor friends over the years have helped that just give you the confidence to know like what everybody else is doing so you can see what's working and what's not. Absolutely. Yeah. And I have a, it's maybe two other guys I know that also flip homes here in Maplewood, South Orange and do really well. And just seeing their success gives me drive and motivation and keeps me going and knowing that, yeah, there's deals out there. There's money to be made. He's killing it. So yeah. it motivates me to kill it. And yeah. It's nice to have. It's important to network. That's awesome. You segued yourself into your next question. It's what is the most important trait for a real estate investor to have? You said drive. 
Let's do a little bit more deep dive on what is what do you in your mind? What's the drive for real estate investor? That's so important. What part and what's the most important part that makes it work? I, I think it's it's again, it's not you don't really have a boss overseeing you. You're not you don't have work reviews, performance reviews. So it's really all on you. If you're not, I think it's going to be tough if you're not passionate about it because there's no one over your shoulder. There's no one pushing you. There's no one checking on you. So I think I'm, I am lucky. I, before real estate, I did, I thought people that worked in their passion, that was like something people said, just right. to seem happy, but really, truly, it is my passion. I think it's important for a thing like real estate that's so entrepreneurial and so individual that it to be your passion, because I still am every night almost before bed, I'm scrolling realtor.com. <laughs> Me too. And, I got a problem. And I love it. Yeah. And I'll check on a new town every day. And I've been looking, you're in Mendham, right? Yeah, I'm in Mendham now. Yeah. I, I, discovered Mendham a couple months ago. And I can't believe how much you Come can get for your money in Mendham. It's yeah. unbelievable. So but that, now that, Mendham- I think what you're saying is so important because I think it shows like if you look at what you guys do at the Home Revivalist, you know, how I flip, how my friends flip, how your friends flip. We love the homes. I'm not mm-hmm. doing crappy flips. That's embarrassing mm-hmm. to me. The crappy flippers out there are making our lives harder because people come in with a magnifying glass on us when we're like, We did everything. And if you find something, no problem. I'll fix it. I'm not worried about it. But it's just it's such a weird industry now because so many people thought they could get into flipping. But I think that you can tell if somebody loves a home right when you walk into a flipper's home and you're like into a flipper's like new listing. You're like, damn, this is nice. You know that. And I feel like that just like you feel like when I'm finished with a project, I'm like in love with it. I don't want to keep it. I want to sell it and get the money. But I really like proud of that process, like aesthetically, what it looks like in the end. Do you guys go in the end? Like it feels good, right? It's just such like a proud moment, not like having our kids, but like, it's nice to see you finished a project and like someone else is going to take ownership and be obsessed with it. That to me is like really cool thing about flipping. Absolutely. And we've, it's your, it's like your baby for four months and you're going to go every day. You might as well, you're going to be working there every day. You might as well make it look good and be proud of it. And it's going to, if you take, you're going to, in our area, at least, I don't, I can't speak for all areas, but in our area, you're going to get your money back. Yeah. Yeah. And the inspectors here are tough. Uh, so if you miss things or don't do something, even when I do everything, the inspector is still buying things because these homes are a hundred years old. Yeah. So the more you replace, the more you update, the more you fix properly, the more confidence your buyers will have, the easier your closing process will be. And you won't have buyers backing out or dropping out. And they can tell in this area. Right you away. Know. There's nothing worse than you have, as an agent, you have a client who buys a quote flip and then you have a laundry list at inspections because then it's just going to tell you there's got to be more wrong that we miss. So I do. I think your relationships with the towns are really important. You're right. And they're tough and they should be sometimes a little psychotic in some areas. But there's nothing you can do. So you just have to touch the bases on when they tell you to. Awesome. This one has been a good question for everyone. What's wrong with the real estate investing world right now? Your answer, oh, I agree with this one. Large funds and corporations investing in it. Which part are you referring to? I'll try to stay out of my rabbit hole on some of them, but like I completely agree. So one problem I have is I've I've been wanting to, I love residential, but I've been wanting to get more into commercial. Mm -hmm. And I've been lucky enough over five years to find two good deals in Maplewood that I jumped on and purchased. Mm -hmm. But there's five buildings in here on the market now in Maplewood, and I know they're them. so overpriced. I know. It's ridiculous. You're they're, talking about the so one that's right on the. There's one that's right on the corner. It's nice, but it's like definitely overpriced. I know for two million. That's yeah. across the street from mine. Yeah, and the, I think the building's worth like one two. Right? It's absurd. And it's it, the only way they get away with it is because there's these funds in New York City, I don't, whether they're hedge funds or private equity funds, but they're just adding it to their portfolio and they're happy with the 5% cap rate return. And so it, it works and it just it make would make no sense for a small investor like me and you. And there's no money to be made. You almost have to find these things off market yeah. and have a prior relationship. So that really bugs me. And I feel like these companies like Blackstone are getting into duplexes and single family homes. And it's just making a bit of a mess of everything and overpricing. Um, exactly. Things. If you just look like what Open Door did and what happened out there in Arizona, like these companies are just making mistakes on buying in bulk. So if you're a hedge fund and you have whatever, $50 million, 
you buy 100 multi families, you may think that's not going to work, but they're not, there's not enough due diligence in that process. They're buying like bulk as much as they can. And then it comes back to be a problem later. I agree. And that it's it's in the self storage space, that's like extremely common. REITs Mm -hmm. and hedge funds were buying up like all of them. So you really can only market to like the mom and pops who are resistant. And then that takes a more long term nurture, I think. Yeah. Almost. What was it? Zillow that tried to flip homes? Yeah. Uh, In Arizona also. It's, I just, I think in my own mind, I just wonder, sure, real estate's a great asset. I think that there's syndications and stuff that work, but everybody's so obsessed with going bigger and everything. And like for people like you and I, we run similar to, I don't want to do 10 projects at once. That sounds terrible because then I feel like I'm just going to be stretched too thin. So doing one or two flips at a time is like just my speed. I don't really care about how many doors I have. I really care about the houses. So like even if for investment properties, I want to make sure they're like doing the best, like their upkeep is good. So the tenants or your commercial tenants are well taken care of because that's what's going to get me less calls. I like real estate, but I don't want to get more calls from having more real estate. Do you agree with that? I've been there. I've had four flips going on and you miss things and it bites you. Yeah, even when you're good, it's just too much. It's too much stuff. Yeah, yeah. You miss good. things and it hurts you. All right. One way we could all collectively make real estate investing world better, more collaboration. And this being part of it, what do you mean by the more collaboration? I And I want to preface it by saying you said something important to other high-end flippers of Maplewood. I know you, so I know that you agree with this. I don't even think that investing is competitive at all. I think it's all collaborative. It makes it weird for me when people like, I'm going to steal that property from you. I'm like, you can have it, dude. I don't really, whatever. There's plenty of properties. It's hard to find them, but I'll find them. Is that what you mean? You feel like, I feel like just talking to other investors is always fun for me. Yeah, no, I love it. I think pre-COVID, I think it was a lot easier. And then COVID came and I sort of think a lot of it stopped socializing and collaborating. But yeah, just doing things like this, a podcast, doing me calling the local investor, having lunch, or just talking on the phone about what's going on with the market. Every time I talk to someone, I learn something yeah. about real estate, whether it's a tidbit about the market, about a, maybe he's got a home that he doesn't have time to work. And you got to be on the top of the mind of whether it's an agent, another investor, and good things will happen. You'll get connect, make good connections. Yeah, long term, all tons of your deals will just come from relationships. Just like you said, at the mm-hmm. time when you have war, like sometimes you're just like, I would just like to offload one of these to a friend. Mm-hmm. I don't even need to like make any money. I just want somebody else to do the job. I can't because it's just going to sit there. You can't get to it. So relationships can get you so far of just knowing who works where, what the process is, sharing info about the towns. Like we said, towns can be difficult. You want to know, hey, should I really do this in this town? Somebody might tell yeah. you no, because it's, it's tough. Yeah, I agree with that a lot. And I think part of this podcast is about the mindful <laughs> approach. And I think that's more collaborative than competitive. I don't know what people mm-hmm. are competing for. The America is so dense. There's houses everywhere, at least in the Northeast. They're everywhere. So you can find yeah. them. You just have to exercise a little patience. Let me see here. Best book you've read that influenced your career in real estate? And you said you read a lot. This one is Confessions of a Real Estate Entrepreneur. Tell us when you read that and how it hit you and how it keeps keeps you moving now. Yeah, I got to read it again because I, I read it maybe 15 years ago yeah. and then again 10 years ago. And it's really interesting because it's a space that I haven't even really figured out yet. But it's a guy that bought properties. And so an example is you buy a commercial space that's maybe a stationary store and it's making five grand a month. The commercial properties are all valued off of rent. So that building's only worth 400 grand, but he converts them to maybe a restaurant. Yeah. Well, that restaurant's bringing in 15 grand a month. And now that building's worth 1.5 million. And he literally did nothing except change the tenant to a restaurant and let them build the kitchen right. in the back. And now the building's tripled because it's it's bringing in three times the amount of rent. So he did that on a much larger scale with like warehouses in Connecticut or something and literally would buy a dilapidated warehouse and get like tech companies in there and take it from a hundred grand a year in rent to a million and the valuations would just go crazy. But I love that concept and it's so interesting to me. That's what happened in the industrial space. I own a big industrial park actually in the Hamptons and Bridgehampton with partners we have for years, but like industrial spaces all over the country in the last 20 years have become so popular because all these companies that have things that our kids like, or my kids when they were younger, 
bounce houses, trampoline gyms, all these like arcade type mm-hmm. places. They're all in industrial, all escape rooms because they don't want to pay. They don't need to be on Main Street. So all yeah. I really love the industrial space. I think it's so smart. Our industrial park is really hybridized. It's 16 units and it's all businesses now. You know, it's, it's cool. where the Soul Cycle was and Plum TV. They're just regular businesses because it's a, you don't need to be on Main Street to be a lot of businesses and the rents on Main Street are so exorbitant. What if you could mm-hmm. build out an industrial property? So yeah, it's really interesting. It's a nice way to get to something different at the end. And I think as an investor, like you said, you're interested in commercial. You have a couple, but you'd like to do more. That's how I'm always thinking is like, what's another asset class that might be interesting to me so I could stay diversified over the long term? Awesome. Mm-hmm. This is one question I ask at the end. If you could give new real estate investors one piece of advice, what would it be? I always had someone, luckily I don't need that person anymore, but someone to sort of ask questions to and bounce ideas off of. I'm, Maybe a mentor, maybe not a mentor, maybe just a friend, maybe a realtor. That's a, but fine. I think if you're trying to go at it on your own, you're going to make a lot of mistakes. You're going to make mistakes no matter what, but at least, you know, if you have someone to guide you and help you, that would be my biggest thing. Find sort of a mentor type person to help bounce ideas and questions off of. And I think that'll speed up your, if it takes five, 10 years to get good, you can just get good at it a lot faster. Yeah. And I think it goes to stuff we've already talked about on this episode. It's just building relationships and making sure like the more information you can get from other people and give to other people, the better it's going to be for everybody. It's just such Mm a, we talked about on other podcasts, but it's just like the investing world's a lot smaller than people think. If somebody it does is. something bad, we're all going to know at some And yeah. that can really put a hurting on your business because it will get out into the public sphere and you just don't want that to happen at all. Yeah. Awesome. So where's the best place to find you guys is the home revivalists.com, correct? Yep. Either our website or Instagram. Is yeah. the home revivalists also. Yeah, yeah. I encourage everyone to check it out. Your projects are really badass. <laughs> they really right. are. I think it's, a, and I also, I always, I like seeing husband and wife or partnership of any kind working together in real estate because it's just fun. And then you can transfer a home to someone else who's going to come do the same thing that you guys have done in your own homes. Is that part of the thing that makes it so exciting for you guys to do together? So nice because we, I don't know many people who are really good at, I'm really good at project management and numbers, but I have no design sense. And my wife is really good at design and she doesn't really know the numbers well. So it's, you need, I feel like you need that other person. And it's great that it's my wife. I get to, you know, pay my wife and she helps me make money and I help her make money. And yeah, but it's like like with kids though, too, it's like a collaborative thing. Like I've seen your kids on social media and obviously on the shows we watch, it's nice to have your kids involved because like we all hope my kids are older now, like 21 and 19. And I'm just waiting for them to say, let's go one, get your license Two, let's get an investment property. Like they're just there. I'm ready to go. And I know you guys are probably thinking about that already. Yeah, it's funny. I brought that up to my wife the other day. I was like, when is my son, my old, I have three kids, 14, 11, and three. And I'm like, when is my oldest going to start yeah. wanting to come to the job sites yeah. with me? Yeah, yeah. Maybe next year. I drag him there sometimes. Yeah. Depends. So. If you put something cool up in the house that's like sports oriented or video oriented, the kids are like, oh, okay. I didn't realize you could have a rock climbing wall. Sure. Yeah. 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 Awesome. Scott, I really appreciate you stopping by. The viewers and the listeners can find you guys at the Home Revivalist. And you you do big higher end kitchen work and full rehabs and everything, correct? Yep. And I also do individual training sessions sometime. If people, I did a lot more pre-COVID yeah. and getting back into it a little bit now, but it's usually just a couple hours. It's follow me around or I we do it here in my office and teach you the ins and outs of flipping. So that's a that's something I do as well. Yeah. Best way to contact you guys is either via DM on Instagram or just the contact through your website. Yeah. Yep. Awesome. Absolutely. Before you hop off, I'm going to do this every time before we get off. If you like listening to the podcast and you like this episode with Scott Friedman, leave us a review. It's the only way that podcasts really work. It's nice. And if this is a great way to share things with your friends, if you're invest- in, interested in real estate investing, these episodes are great to share for new investors, middle range investors, experienced investors. As Scott and I both said on this podcast episode, we never stop learning. 
Don't you feel mm-hmm. like you can learn something on a new job any day, a new episode? There's always something out there to learn. So much. And it's you got to you have to keep learning because if even if I just take a few weeks off from reading or listening to podcasts, you can tell like I feel like I missed out on yeah. things. So I still maybe I don't learn as much as the first couple flips, but I still learn a lot with every flip. Even your podcasts have been great. I'm Appreciate learning things it. on your podcasts. I you try and learn learning is like a never ending thing. I agree. Awesome. Yeah. Scott, thanks so much. I hope to see you in person soon. We'll definitely yes. make that happen. This is Jonathan Green, and this has been episode 16 of Zen and the Art of Real Estate Investing. Thank you.